Hi, this is Priyanka and I welcome you all to Sujan Wednesday webinars. For those of you who are attending for the first time, this is a community initiative by Sujan Technologies. And as a part of this initiative, we host webinars every alternate Wednesday. We invite experts from different domains who talk on a variety of subjects like front-end technologies, UI UX, mobile apps, media, entrepreneurship, digital marketing, community building, and many more. Today, we will learn about the various benefits of working in repeatable design patterns and how to create a working set of elements that allow both for rapid iteration of design prototypes and implementation of templates and code. I would request all participants to please type in any questions that you have during the presentation and we'll take them up in the last 15 minutes of this webinar. I would now like to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. We have with us Dan Danny Norden. Danny is the Senior User Experience Designer at Howard Business Review, where she works with a cross-functional team of designers, technologists, and product managers to integrate user experience into an agile development process. She is also a very accomplished speaker, teacher, and writer, teaching courses for General Assembly in Boston and Skillsoft International. She's got a book published called Drupal for Designers, which is available uh, on O'Reilly Media. So while you get hooked on to Donnie's presentation, please don't forget to take this conversation live on Twitter using our hashtag SrijanWW. I would repeat, SrijanWW. You can share your thoughts by tagging us and Danny in your tweets using our handles at the rate Srijan and at the rate Danny GRRL. So without taking any more time, I think we should get started. Danny, over to you. Thank you, Priyanka, for that lovely introduction. Um, nice to meet you all. My name is Danny Norden, and I am uh, here to talk to you today about documenting design patterns for cross-functional um, product teams. So a little bit of background about me. Um, my name is Danny Norden, as I mentioned before. I am the Senior User Experience Designer at Harvard Business Review, and what I do every day is work with product and marketing and editorial and design and tech to really understand the people who visit our web property, hbr.org, and use those insights to make a better experience across the website. And um, I also do some teaching at General Assembly in Boston. I do the user experience boot camp there. Um, I was previous to that teaching the 12 week, um, the 12 week evening course. Um, I also am an author for O'Reilly Media. I have both the book Drupal for Designers and I have a video series on learning UX fundamentals. So let's talk about design patterns. Um, the, the thing that's nice about design patterns is they take all of these bits and blobs of code that we write as we're creating a website, and they break them down into reusable components that are able to very healthy quick us, uh, very quickly help us mock up new features, create new prototypes. When I arrived at HBR, we were using something called Pattern Lab, which is an open source repository that essentially helps you create a website that actually documents and houses all of your design patterns. And we used it primarily throughout the uh, redesign of hbr.org to get review, to get feedback on design patterns, and to very quickly build up the template. So the thing that was nice about this was that it was actually based in the same CSS um, and code that was live on the website. So it was really easy to create a prototype or mock something up that actually showed us what things would look like on the site, what they would look like in code. It also um, defaults to mobile first. So you can see what things look, on a, look like on a smaller screen and then build up to larger as you go. So this really was useful for helping to speed up front-end production. And we really loved it for that purpose. But timing 
and the timing required to get all of this work done on the front end basically meant that there were certain things that ended up falling to the wayside in the way that we were cataloging our design patterns. The first thing was we really didn't document the design patterns. We didn't talk about what they were used for, where they were used. We didn't really have any guidelines for how to use them. And so what ended up happening was the site, as the site kept growing, more and more stuff ended up in there, and things got really disorganized. And then when the design team was trying to use it to make their workflow more efficient, they were still working in Photoshop comp and eventually moved into actual prototypes. But they couldn't quickly get a sense of what are the actual patterns, and they couldn't really get a sense of what things would look like across multiple screens because they were still working in Photoshop. So this resulted in a number of different problems when you actually brought this from Pattern Lab into the code that goes on the site. One of the things we saw was issues with consistency and legibility across the site. As you can see on the left, we've got red icons and red text against a black background, which really isn't very very readable. And then on the right, you see the um, you see these icons as they're supposed to be seen against a white background. We also had significant contrast issue. The number of grays that we were using in images and in other areas of the site basically meant that every time we had gray text, which appears pretty commonly throughout our site, it would be shown against a gray, a gray background, and in many cases, it wasn't readable at all. The other thing that we had that became problematic very quickly was when designers and production editors were trying to create a call out or some other thing uh, within the context, uh, within the content itself. The developers were giving them this long string of HTML that they would basically be asked to insert into a WordPress post. Um, this is a very good example of what you see here. Um, in many cases, these these helper classes were taking the uh, were taking the place of creating good reusable default patterns. So when I arrived we realized, looking at this pattern repository, that we really had some work to do to make this uh, something that the organization could actually use to guide good design. So we stepped back from a little bit, and we started by looking at some other pattern libraries that were out there in the wild. MailChimp was one of the first ones that we looked at. This is the slide you're looking at here. They had a very nice, concise, way of organizing their patterns and they focused on all of the main things that you wanted to that you wanted to hit when you were uh, creating a pattern library. Yelp is a very similar one, although they have a much shorter pattern library. It's all one single page. It really hit all of the major components of a page within the Yelp application. But we also wanted this to really be a tool that represented what design meant at HVR. So for this one, we looked at a company called Patients Like Me, who actually put their guiding principles and their um, user experience principles right on the front page of the style guide. Once we had this inspiration in place, we had to start looking at um, taking a very hard, critical look at the patterns that we'd actually created over the year or so that we had been building out this design guide and start organizing them. Start figuring out what goes where, what's necessary, what's no longer necessary. And we started restructuring things a little bit. And we did this through workshops with the design team and with the, um, and with the front end development team, really start starting to dig in and keeping the same structure pattern lab but moving things around and organizing them and, and bringing them into categories that made sense. As a third step, we actually started writing down what the purpose of the guide was and what principles we wanted to bring into our design, um, our design patterns. When we did that, 
we actually um, focused first on some of the standard building blocks. So things like our design principles, our colors, our fonts, our typography, what are the icons that we use, what does the grid look like, um, and what are the helper classes that people can use to create visual elements on a page. So then we realized um, as we continued in the user experience practice and we continued noticing these usability issues on the site, there was really a need for something a little bit deeper than that. For example, how do you document what system messaging looks like, what alerts look like, what they say? Um, how do you document usability testing that's been done? How do you document how a usability test gets run? Um, and then also, it's one thing to define what something looks like, but it's another to see how things interact. So what are the actual interaction patterns we're dealing with? After all, we are dealing with a digital product here. We need to be able to make sure we understand what's the flyout versus what's the modal versus what is a swipe versus what is a tap. Um, we want to make sure that we're actually keeping all of these things in mind as we're doing our work. And as we started slowly putting some of that stuff in there, we ended up getting some pushback from people on the team. And what they said was, hey, why are we doing user research in here? Why are we, why are we trying to put user research guidelines in here? That's not really design. Or we've been trying to make a wiki that no one ever reads a central location for all of this stuff. So what we ended up having to do as we came up against this resistance was to really step back and completely redefine what the pattern library is supposed to be. Um, at first, it was really just about taking what we had and shifting it around a bit. But we really needed to step back and understand the audience for this, who needed to actually use this, who is the universe of people that touches our website. So the way we started with that is we started by figuring out who the actual audience is for this pattern library. At first, it was really, it was really meant for an internal audience of developers. It really was not designed, it was really not put into place in a way that designers could really understand. Um, and then there's also writers and marketers who are regularly creating stuff for our website that need to understand where to go for if you want something to look a, a specific way. But then there's also specific use cases, that, uh, more specific use cases that we needed to understand where people were outside of our building. So if an outside vendor comes in and needs to create something, if we have a contractor, if we have a summer intern, all of these different people actually come in and make things for our website or make things for our product. We need to be able to give them something that says, these are the guidelines with which you should work. And so once we started understanding who the audience, with, uh, the audience is, we really needed to align on what we were doing here. What is the point of all of this? What are we trying to create? So we established three primary goals. Uh, one was to basically come to an agreement that these are the guidelines we use. These are the things that drive what we do here. We also wanted to create a repository of interface elements that we could draw from as we're creating new features or as we're um, trying to adjust things throughout the site. And ultimately, we wanted to make sure that design and tech could work together very efficiently to design and iterate new sections of the site. So this also caused us to really redefine what style guide meant in our mind. Are we talking just about CSS classes, or are we talking about the actual components that build up the interface? Are we talking about what an H1 versus an H5 looks like, or are we really discussing the typographic hierarchy and how we use type throughout the site? And with system messaging, are we really talking about just what an alert looks like versus a flyout, 
or are we setting standards for what system messages should say and who should be responsible for creating that content? So ultimately, we landed on a process that I'd like to share with you as a potential driver for your own process. And what I'd really like to do is make this webinar very interactive. So we might end up going through this process rather quickly and then finish up um, even earlier and have longer, uh, more time for Q&A because I really do like to keep my uh, presentations conversational. Uh, it's really boring to sit here and listen to a webinar of, of one person talking all day. So the biggest place to start is the basics. What are the primary building blocks of your site? And if you're a front-end developer, you can really think of this as you would when you are starting the baseline typography or the baseline CSS for any site that you're building. You start with defining what your colors are. You start by defining what fonts you're using and how, what sizes all of these would come to. Um, you might also start getting into what inputs and form elements look like. You want to define the grid that you're using and how that is organized. And then you also want to get into things like image size, uh, image sizes and icons that you use. Once you've got those basic elements in, then you can start adding in building blocks. So your building blocks could be, for example, what does a content teaser look like? What, is a type, what, what does the, um, the heading and byline of an article look like? What are the icons that you use, the standard icons utilities that you, um, icon utilities that you use? What does a call out look like? What does a button look like? What do menus um, look like? What do sidebar widgets look like? All of these things are sort of the basic building blocks of the design system that you're creating. As you're building those up, you can actually start building up from those basic components into larger templates and, and sections of a page that can actually help you define, okay, well, if I'm dealing with a search, search result, uh, results page, these are the elements that go on that page. If I have a product page, these are the elements that go on that page. And what this does is really helps you define the overall layout and how all of these different building blocks look when they're actually presented on the website as a whole thing. And then you really want to establish, um, and this is a relatively new thing in discussion of pattern libraries and site style guides, you really want to establish some standards for how you speak to people through your interface. Um, there are many different things that you can get into. The basics that I'm trying to put in, um, that, that we're trying to put in here at Harvard Business Review, is who are the people that we're talking to? What do they need from us? What do they expect from us? And this ends up going into um, things like feedback messages, what system emails should say, what is the voice and the tone that we're using, how do we speak to people, and then also what are the specific ways we say certain things. So for example, do you say sign in or do you say log in? Do you say register or do you say create an account? Do you ever call someone a user through the interface? Do you call them an anonymous? Do they call them a registrant? Do you call them a registered user? What are the things that you use to refer to people in the copy that you write on your website? And finally, you really have to get this out among your team, not just design and tech, but also to the marketing team, to the editorial team, to anyone who touches the website that you're working on to make sure that they understand that this is there, they understand what it's for and what they're using it for. And you also want to make sure that you're using these throughout the design phase of anything that you're building. As you're redoing things, um, you want to make sure that you're keeping the existing design patterns in mind. And then as you're creating new patterns or you're making changes to old patterns, how does that impact the style guide that you're building?
And finally, the most important thing to do is to really understand that this is an evolving, iterative process. This is going to change over time. This is going to get um, longer. It's going to get shorter. Some patterns will be removed. Some patterns will be added over time. And the, the worst thing you can do is let a pattern library get stale um, and not represent what is actually on the website. So this is the basics of putting together a design pattern library and how we've been doing it at HBR. Um, I think the most important takeaway here is both that being able to document these patterns helps you build the interface more efficiently, but it also, most importantly, gets the entire team talking to each other and agreeing on certain fundamental uh, tenets and principles that they're going to use to create the product going forward. It's not an easy process to actually create one of these, um, but in many cases, for example, with Pattern Lab, it can actually be built into the front-end development process as a way that you build up to an experience on an entire site, and you can reuse patterns and create a sustainable design system. So with that, I realize this is brief, but I want to hear from you. I want to uh, want to hear your questions. Let's have a conversation about style guides. Well, uh, that was a great session. Thank you, Danny, for sharing these valuable insights on documenting design patterns for cross-functional teams and how they can actually, I mean, it was very interesting for you to keep it crisp and wanting to have the session to be more engaging. Um, I would request everyone to please type in any questions that you have. You can also raise your hand, press the raise hand button on your control panel to ask your question directly through your microphone, or you can type your questions in the chat box below. Um, so I believe while we get some questions, Dani, would you just like to give us a quick run through of the process of creating a document, you know, uh, or process of creating a library? a style library or patent library? Absolutely. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, really the process relates to, I mean, really the process is about, in our case, it was really about, so in our case, it was really about taking what we had in, um, it was really about taking what we had and putting it into some sort of order. So what we had was something that was, it was really useful during the design, like during the initial design phase. It was less useful as we were trying to expand on what we've done. Um, and part of that had to do with the fact that we had all of these menus, um, all of these menus that were full of all of these different design patterns, and some of them reflected what existed on the website today. Some of them really didn't look anything like what was on the site. And so a lot of the initial work was really culling um, those design patterns and really understanding, okay, what is what, what belongs where, and how do we sort of reorganize this. And it took us a few weeks to really get there because we, obviously we were um, dealing with a website that was already established. With a website that is brand new, you can actually build up directly from the CSS code and start saying, okay, well, these are the colors, these are the fonts, this is the grid, and just start documenting um, what you have. The uh, Pattern Lab is one tool that's available to do this. Um, there are many other tools, uh, for example, Nile Style Sheets, uh, KSS, which will actually go directly from your CSS code and parse out the comments in order to create a style guide. Um, that tool actually seems to work very well. It breaks down a little bit when you start getting into the larger components. The benefit that we saw of Pattern Lab is that it could actually allow us to take entire chunks of content. So for example, we can have this entire chunk of content, which we call the hero image, and this entire chunk of content, which we call a stream item, those can exist as unique patterns in and of themselves, 
and then they can be popped into a template very, very easily. Um, that was one of the things that we saw that we really liked about Pattern Lab because it went beyond just what does an H1 look like and what's the palette of colors that I can choose from. The, um, the other thing, if you're going from a website that's already been built, then you really want to take what you have in existence and you would want to visit each site section or each template that you're working with and start breaking it down into chunks. What are the components that actually exist on that page? So for here, for example, this is a search results page. You can see that there's um, a featured product, there's a results header, there are filters that exist, there's a search box that exists. All of these can be components that can be reused in other areas. And really the criteria used for breaking down from a template into a component is does this item get reused as a whole thing or does it get reused in individual pieces? So for example, this um, you can see in this blue block in this blue box here, what you can see is that the stream item pattern that we've got here is exactly the same in that blue box. It's just being adjusted to include um, to include a product or to include a, a call to action to buy the product, and it's got a blue background on it. So this is really the benefit of working in these repeatable design patterns and of documenting them because you can very easily say, okay, well we've got this pattern. If we make this change to it or adjust it in this way, then it suits this other purpose. Um, all right, thanks a lot, Dan Danny, for the quick walkthrough. Uh, while we move on to questions, before, in fact, before we move on to questions, I would just like to put up another reminder that you can take this conversation live by tweeting about us using our hashtag SwidgenWW and tagging our Twitter handle AdderageSwidgen and tagging da Danny there at, by using her handle AdderageDanny, D-A-N-I-G-R-R-L. I'll start by taking our first question here by Tammy, who wants to know, are these style guides in code? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, they are in code. Um, what the design team initially did was, what the design team initially did was they actually created a style guide that was a PDF that was really meant to sort of break down the components and the, the guidelines and, and what we were going to do. But this was alongside the Pattern Lab um, repository, which was actually in code. So at first, our Pattern Lab repository was linked to the actual CSS for the site. So it limited the designers a little bit because they couldn't really make changes to what was in Pattern Lab without actually impact, directly impacting what happened on the production site. So it ended up limiting, uh, limiting the experimentation that we were able to do. So what we started doing was uh, moving the CSS that was used on our live site into another repository and then porting that CSS over to Pattern Lab. So it gave the designers a lot more freedom to start organizing things in a way that made sense to them. Uh, because it's really is meant to be a shared tool between design and front end. So the big benefit to having these types of style guides is that it actually represents the real code that's on the site and the real CSS that is on the site. So it makes it much faster to put together templates. It doesn't take away the need for a non-code tool to build out designs and prototypes. But at the very least, it gives us a very clear direction on what things are going to look like when they're actually on the web. Hi, thank you so much. I hope that answers your question, Tammy. If you have another question, please feel free to type in. Meanwhile, our next, our next question is by Joao. He wants to know, how do you work concerning requirement gathering? I mean, before the actual design of the pattern. Let's take an example of list views. How and who gathers the functionalities that are required there? 
So I believe um, you broke up a little bit there, but I believe the question is about how do you do requirements gathering prior to doing all of this design work. Um, so one of the things that is useful about the pattern library is that because many of these styles are defined, and I mean, mind you, requirements were gathered before we even created the library, um, so that's one piece of it, but because we have these patterns defined, our requirements gathering sessions are really much more focused on what is the content, what is the functionality, what are the things, like what is the actual goal of what we're trying to create. And it gets much less into the weeds of what color should X button be, what, what font should we use for this. So it actually makes the requirements gathering much more efficient. And it also makes the prototyping and the designing much more efficient because you can very quickly mock something up in a tool like Balsamic um, or Axure and point to the design patterns that already exist on the site. And so it makes it much, much quicker for us to come up with something to actually show to the stakeholders that meets the requirements. All right, Joe, I hope that answers your question. If, you're, if you have a follow-up question, please type that in. Meanwhile, we'll move on to our next question by Cheryl, who wants to know, uh, who actually wants you to put up the slide for Pattern Lab and primary building of your website. So I, it would also help if you can actually quickly, you know, run her through it again. Okay, so, the, um, so you're talking about Pattern Lab? So is this, the, is this what you're talking about? Yes, I believe that's what she um, was referring to. OK. Yeah. So yeah, so let's go through the, let's go through the whole idea. So Pattern Lab is based on the idea of atomic web design, um, which was created, which was come up with by this man named uh, Brad Frost. Um, the site itself is patternlab.io. And it is actually a GitHub repository that allows you to create a small static website that actually helps you document a lot of the design patterns that you have um, on your website. And there's the, the way that this is intended to be used is really to create a fully, um, to build a design system from the ground up. So let me. I'm not going to do live development right now. But the idea here is that you start with your atoms. And the atoms are really sort of the basic building blocks. This is literally where you get into, this is the color that I'm using. These are the fonts that I'm using. This is the, um, these are the fonts. Um, or this is what a, um, this is what a um, this is what a font or I'm sorry this is what a button looks like. So this is where we are right now with the pattern library. We're actually actively working on um, revising this and and stripping it down so that it's a little more organized. Um, but what you can see here is that we actually start with the design principles. All right, and these are what we call this is what we call just guidelines. So this is sort of the baseline for what we're for what we're dealing with. With colors, you can actually you can actually see these are all of the colors we use across the site. You can see examples of where those colors are used, and we break them down. For example, by these are sort of the main colors that we use in the hero space versus the colors that we specifically use for visual feedback versus the colors that we use only for backdrop. For typography, we have a basic we have a basic setup of all of the different type styles. And then we have additional classes that we can use for body copy with, with helper classes. So this is really the meat of what the designers need to see. 
But then you build into atoms, which is sort of your basic tags. A lot of the stuff has been moved into guidelines, but you do want to think of things like images, um, images, interface copy guidelines, and um, icons in this space. Molecules are basically atoms that are that are usually used together. So, for example, our stream items. You can see this is really um, a bunch of little atoms, a bunch of little pieces like this utility icon and this stream item that are all used together and they always show up together. So if you wanted to make a new template that had sort of a search item pattern, you would basically just put three or four of these together. You also can get into things like what does a flyout box look like? What are you using for your ads? I think that didn't work. Okay. Then there's also article utilities. And then organisms are entire content sections. So for example, for your home page, this is what your hero looks like. So this is a, a significant chunk of a page. And then a template you actually start seeing what this looks like in a real in a real world. Although I apologize but my uh, my computer is not my my internet is not working very well. So basically what you I mean basically what you do is you build up from the bottom to the top. And guidelines really is something that we added to just focus us and make sure that we weren't taking on too much. Eventually what we found was that the structure of Pattern Lab where you're building up from atoms to templates was very useful for quickly prototyping things, was less useful for bringing things onto the live site. And then as things were changed on the production site, what we found was that they weren't necessarily, those changes weren't necessarily being reflected in Pattern Lab. And so eventually, from a front end perspective, we were really doing work twice. So now, really, what we're trying to do is go through all of these different design patterns that we've created during the process of building things and refine it to the list that we actually want to use for prototyping new things. And then are there things that we want where we want to fundamentally change the design pattern? And how do we accommodate that within the style guide? So hopefully that's, hopefully that's helpful. Yes, I hope so too. Cheryl, if you have another question, please type it in. Meanwhile, we have a flurry of questions, so we'll quickly try to take them all up. Uh, Grant here wants to do, know what teams did you involve in the library building process? Who all did you get inputs from? Um, so the, the initial team was really front-end in development. So that, uh, and actually NUX. So I sort of spearheaded the initiative and said, you know, this is, this is a great thing, but we want to make sure that we can actually use it cross-functionally. So I want to try to turn this into a real style guide rather than just sort of a repository of things. So let's like work on making this a little more organized. And I started doing a lot of the changes that you saw on the, um, on the initial site or on the site that I just demoed for you. So I started making a lot of those initial changes. And what, what happened, which was really interesting, was that design really started taking ownership of this and working with front-end development to sort of organize things and make things, as they say, designer friendly. And basically what that means is giving them a toolkit of things to work with that makes sense to them and would make sense to a junior designer coming onto the team what are the parameters that I have to work with? And they are, they've really been taking most of the lead on that. Um, but the 
Pattern Lab is still mainly used by the design and dev team. What I'm trying to do now is work with um, work with marketing and editorial to really start looking at um, how copy gets written for our site outside of the site content. So things like system messages, feedback, marketing emails, landing pages, all of these different things that we use that are part of the website but aren't the actual um, aren't the actual articles. And so we're working to essentially set guidelines for them so that we know that we're so that we know that we are speaking in a consistent, friendly tone across all of the touch points that our customers are coming at us from. Um, so that is a piece of it that we're working on right now. And at this point, it's still a little up in the air whether it's going to live in the existing pattern library or if it's going to be spun off into its own site. Um, if you look at MailChimp, uh, they actually have one of the, um, they have a, a two different spin-off sites for cop for interface copy. One is um, one is just for interface copy, and then there's another called VoiceandTone.com that is actually examples of interface copy, app copy, uh, marketing emails, blog posts, and it sets up individual guidelines for all of those things. There's another company called FutureLearn that has a style guide that's based on the atomic design principles that includes interface copy as one of the atoms, um, which is the basic building blocks again. So that's still in progress, but um, hopefully that will be getting launched soon. Uh, right, thanks a lot for elaborating on that. Um, Grant, I hope that answers your question. Uh, we'll quickly take up our next question by Kang who wants to know, what is your favorite editor to compose the guidelines? Um, I'm sorry, what, it, what to compose the guide? I missed the last sentence. What do you use to post, to co uh, post okay. the guidelines? I'm, yeah, yeah let, me, let, me, <laughs> let me, probably there's some uh, connectivity issue. So he wants to know, what is your favorite editor to compose these guidelines? Oh, my favorite editor? <laughs> Um, so right now I'm actually using, so for, um, when I work in Pattern Lab, I actually use a, I use a tool called Coda um, because I'm writing HTML and CSS. To work on um, the copy style guides, we're actually working in Google Docs right now. And um, it's either going to live in Pattern Lab or it's going to live in a tool that I'm using called HackPad, H-A-C-K-P-A-D. Um, that actually has proven to be a pretty interesting service just for creating a wiki um, that can be shared with members of the team. Uh, it may end up staying there. I'm not sure yet. All right. Thanks a lot. Our next question is by Alex, who's saying, Hi, it's Alex, a UX designer. Thank you very much for the presentation. A question about format of UX guideline. I assume that it is more mm -hmm. beneficial to create or support it in interactive form, like boot, like a Bootstrap has, rather than having a static PDF. But I suppose not so many companies accept this approach, though. Mainly, main obstacle being the effort. What are your thoughts on that? Um. So I actually tend to think that. I tend to err on the side of um, what one of my friends calls Big D design. So if a style guide is really just about the visual hierarchy, then fine, use a PDF. But when we are designing for digital products, when we're designing for the web, we're not just designing colors and fonts. We're designing interactions. We're designing interactivity. We're designing system feedback. We're basically creating a, an ongoing dialogue between a computer or often series of computers and a human being on the other side of it. And that requires a very different approach. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I fought so hard to have things like interface copy in our design patterns, because I do believe that content and design go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Um, that said, I believe that brand guidelines are extremely important. 
and having something that is literally just a handbook of these are the colors, these are the type styles, this is how you use the logo, um, is more than fine as a start because it's something that you can easily send to a, an outside vendor. It's something that can be used both print and web. Um, and it can, be a very, it can serve a very useful purpose. I just think that if you're designing digital products, you need something that goes into much more detail and actually serves as much as a prototyping tool as documentation. Right. Thanks a lot, Annie. Uh, Alex, I hope that answers your question. Um, I just give you all a quick reminder that we still have about 15 minutes to go. So if you have any more questions, please feel free to type in. Meanwhile, I'll take our next question here by Tammy again, who wants to know who's basically missed the part about how you can transfer the CSS style guide to Exior or Balsamic because he says it's very difficult then he has to design it in other tools um, like Omni, Omni Graphle because that cannot convert the code into graphic patterns. Yeah. <laughs> um, this goes, yeah, this is one of the challenges that we come up against too, uh, as well. So, I mean, our designers, one of our designers codes, I code, but trying to build every design and every prototype in code is simply not efficient for the amount of work we need to get done. It ends up being um, much more efficient for us to be able to mock things up. Now, this gets into an issue of fidelity. And one of the things that we're working towards is being able to synthesize the concept and get across what we're trying to do in a much lower fidelity way because we have these design patterns to point to. And if those design patterns aren't changing, then really you're focused on what the functionality is. You're focused on what's supposed to happen. And so there's two sort of ways that we've done this to, to make it more efficient internally. One is to be able to basically recreate some of those design patterns as Axure widgets, A-X-U-R-E. And what that does is help the prototype things that look very close to what we're trying to create um, and can be used for testing, but also include the interactions without having to code. Um, in Balsamic, we actually just use the standard widgets that are available in Balsamic and use the colors that, are, um, that we use across the site as ways of guideposting things. And that is really nice because for these sort of quick one-off screens, it becomes much, much less about what things look like, um, which is very important because it helps us create consistency throughout the site. So it's not, I mean, it's not an excuse for, or it's not a, an alternative to, um, it's not an alternative to just quickly prototyping something in code. But I have to be honest, knowing several UX designers who code, very typically what happens is you spend a lot of time fighting with code and all of that code gets rewritten anyway. So you're not actually saving time by doing it in code versus something like action. All right, thanks, Danny. I hope your your answer helps Tammy. And he'll probably be able to manage that or handle that challenge better now. Our next question, in fact, our last question is by Cheryl, who wants to know, what was the other style guide tool that you mentioned other than Pattern Lab? Oh, um, so the style guide I mentioned, so there's actually a few of them. If you look for CSS, like if you do a search for, I think, CSS style guide, you'll find a bunch of them. Um, Nile Style Sheet is one of them. It's KSS. Um, let me just go into... So this is one of them, Nile style sheets. And so what this does is basically take specifically written code that's in your text and then parses that out into, um, into documentation. It's sort of like a living, a living, style, a living style guide. Um, it seems like it's a pretty easy thing to do. From what I've seen, it's not extendable into larger um, into larger components. 
So you wouldn't be able to document, for example, a, a blog, a content teaser, or you know, a larger chunk of content. But you can at least get into what does a button look like? What are the type of, what's the typography? What are the other things that you're doing? The other one I saw um, is hologram. I think it's either hologram or holograph. Um, oh, no. Sorry. Um, so this one is the most popular, KSS. And that is probably the one that I recommend. There's also another one, which is a Ruby gem, but I don't remember what it's called right now. All right. Um, thanks a lot, Danny. And I hope, Cheryl, you will be able to explore more of these tools now. Um, now that we are moving, running mm -hmm. towards the end of this webinar, I would request those who still have questions to please mail them at webinars at the registration.in. You can also send your questions to us on Twitter. You can, you probably can see our Twitter handle at the screen right now. Um, thank you once again, Danny, for share, leading such a knowledgeable and, in, and interactive session. We are sure everybody found your presentation very interesting and insightful. A big thank you to all the attendees for joining us today. Uh, before we close, I would also like to announce that our next webinar titled Project Estimation, The Art and Science would be hosted on 8th of July and it would be led by John Nolan, COO at Promet Source. For registrations and more details, you'd be getting a mail from our site. So stay tuned and thank you again for joining us today.